Good evening. I'm Rob Hillis. I'm vice chair of the Friends of the Institute. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Alan Barron this evening and welcoming all of you. And it really is a great turnout. And I suspect it's not for me. <laughs> After graduating from Princeton and Harvard Law School, Alan clerked for the Honorable Roselle Thompson, Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland, and went on to serve as Assistant U.S. Attorney for Maryland, where he successfully prosecuted a variety of high-profile cases involving bribery and organized crime. Allen then entered private practice, where he focused on white-collar crime prosecutions, litigating complex civil cases, and serving as special counsel in public proceedings. From 1987 to 1989, he served as special impeachment counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives in proceedings which resulted in impeachment, conviction, and ultimate removal from office of federal judges Alcee Hastings and Walter Nixon. In 1991, he was appointed special counsel by the governor of Rhode Island to investigate the financial collapse of Rhode Island's privately insured credit unions. In 1993, as special counsel to the Anne Arundel County School Board to Maryland, he investigated allegations of sexual misconduct by high school teachers and students which gained national attention. Senator John Glenn appointed Allen to serve as minority chief counsel to the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee in 1997 to investigate campaign finance abuses. Allen was retained as special impeachment counsel to the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives in 19, 2008 and again in 2009 with regard to the impeachment of U.S. District Judges Thomas Porteous and Samuel B. Kent. Both judges were ultimately impeached. Proteus was then convicted by the U.S. Senate after a trial, and Kent resigned from following his impeachment. Allen is distinguished by the fact that he has served as special impeachment counsel for the House of Representatives on four occasions, more than anyone else in U.S. history. He is thus uniquely qualified to speak about the matter of impeachment and to tell us why it is the constitutional remedy of last resort. Along with that superb background, we are particularly pleased that Alan and his wife, Wendy Owen, chose to make their home in Princeton and to join us as friends of the Institute last year. There will be a period for questions following the talk. Now please join me in welcoming Alan. Good evening, thank you for coming, and thank you for that very nice introduction. And I'm deeply honored to be uh, in this venue, this extraordinary venue, uh, and to speak with you this evening. But let's get to work because we have a lot of ground to cover. In the year 1386, <laughs> you get the idea. Um, the Earl of Suffolk was impeached by the English Parliament because he applied, uh, he applied appropriated funds to purposes other than those specified. I think that's a fancy word for embezzlement. He was charged with having committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Keep that phrase in mind. This is the first time in history that phrase appears. It's noteworthy if we put this in context. It's over a century before Columbus set sail from Spain. On December 8, 2010, G. Thomas Porteous, a United States District Judge from Louisiana, was convicted in the United States Senate of four articles of impeachment, each of which alleged he had committed high crimes and misdemeanors. So the first, for the first um, time that phrase was used in England to the last time it was used in the United States, there's a period of 624 years. Now, the first part of this presentation will review the history of impeachment during those 624 years, but I'm not going to take that long to do it. Uh, the second part will deal with the applicability of that history and this language, high crimes and misdemeanors, in 2018. In order to understand the American Institute of Impeachment, it's important to be familiar with its antecedents. You must remember that nine members of the Constitutional Convention had been trained as lawyers in the, at the Inns of Court 
in England. They were addressing the issues of impeachment in the Constitution against the backdrop of 400 years of English law and history. So let's look at briefly at the institution of impeachment in England. The growth of English Im impeachment law is divided into two eras. As I noted, we encounter the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors in 1386 for the impeachment of the Earl of Suffolk. In 1459, Lord Stanley was impeached by Parliament for not sending his troops to a battle in Staffordshire. That trial ended the first era of impeachment in England. We then find a gap of 162 years in which there are no impeachments in England. And why was that? It's because the monarchy was so strong that the great state trials take place in camera stella. Any Latin scholars? OK. Uh, star chamber proceedings. And so parliament retreats. Parliament retreats from the scene. And yet, beginning with the reign of James I, we enter the second era of English impeachments, and it's a kind of constitutional warfare between Parliament and the monarchy for supremacy. Between 1621 and 1805, there were 54 impeachments in England. What were the kinds of activities for which people were impeached? Well, Lord Treasurer Middlesex in 1624 was impeached because he allowed contracts for greatly needed gunpowder to lapse for one of payment. Chief Justice Scroggs, sounds like something out of Dickens, doesn't it? Chief Justice Scroggs in 1680 was impeached for discharging the grand jury before they made presentments against papists. Dr. Sacherville, the rector of St. Savior's Church, was impeached and convicted for having preached two sermons inculcating the doctrine of unlimited passive obedience. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Absolutely not. In the 17th century, a man named Floyd was impeached and convicted for disparaging the king and queen of Bohemia. Who knew? I mean, you're going to believe the trouble this guy got into. He was punished by being led through London for two days on a horse facing backwards while holding the horse's tail in his hands. He was then put in the pillory, branded with a K, and imprisoned in the Tower of London for life. Well, what can we extrapolate from this brief survey? <laughs> well, for one, don't disparage the king and queen of Bohemia. <laughs> In England, anyone could be impeached, even a private person. The only exception who couldn't be impeached was the monarch. Second, it was truly a criminal proceeding. You might lose your freedom as well as your job. Third, the act for which you were impeached did not have to be indictable as a crime. And finally, on occasion, impeachments would be brought and no trial was held. It was a kind of warning so that if Chief Justice Scroggs was impeached for not uh, charging enough papists, I suspect he got the message. And now it's September of 1787. We're at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Now recall that nine of the 55 members of the, uh, at the convention had studied at the Inns of Court in England and would have been familiar with the English impeachment. Now the irony is that at the time, this time, impeachment in England had been virtually discredited as an institution. The, at, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, the impeachment of Warren Hastings was underway in England. Hastings had been the Governor General of India. And Edmund Burke, who was a great hero to the colonists, he supported them, was one of the leading accusers of Hastings. And the proceeding was a fiasco. It went on for nine years, OK? And Hastings is then acquitted. And that was sort of the death knell of impeachment in England. There's one more after that of no particular consequence. So thus, even as England was abandoning impeachment, 
the republic was incorporating a version of it into the new constitution. And why was that? The framers were concerned that having decided there would be a single rather than a plural executive, that they had created a potentially more dangerous head of state than the British monarch. Colonel Mason, one of the, fortunately we have a lot of their quotes about these different issues. Colonel Mason, one of the delegates stated, and I quote, no point is of more importance than that the right of impeachment shall be continued. Shall any man be above justice? Above all, shall that man be above it who can commit the most extensive injustice? Well, on the other hand, there was genuine concern that the president, or as he was sometimes called the chief magistrate, that he not serve only at the pleasure of the legislature. So now it's September 8th, 1787, nine days before the Constitution is signed. This is from the records. The trial of impeachments against the president for treason and bribery was taken up. Colonel Mason, why is the provision restrained to treason and bribery only? Treason, as defined in the Constitution, will not reach many great and dangerous offenses. Hastings, referring back to Warren Hastings, is not guilty of treason. Attempt to subvert the Constitution may not be treason as above defined. And Mason then moves to add, after the word bribery, the words or maladministration. And that's seconded. James Madison is not happy. He says, so vague a term will be equivalent to a tenure during pleasure of the Senate. Colonel Mason then got the message. He withdrew maladministration and submitted other high crimes and misdemeanors. That's how it got in. So impeachment is put into the Constitution, but in a fundamentally changed way from the English version. First, there are no impeachments against private individuals. It's directed against the president, the vice president, and civil officers, such as cabinet members, judges. Justice Story, who was a very important comment, uh, important uh, analyst of the Constitution, commented that the only exemptions would be the military. The only penalty in this country was removal from office with possibly being barred from holding a future position of honor, trust, or profit under the laws of the United States. When the Senate finds a party um, guilty and therefore they're being removed from office, they then take, sometimes, not always, will take a second vote to bar them from holding any future office. Now this is marked in marked contrast to the posture in England where losing your position might be the least of your concerns. Above all, whereas in England impeachment was a criminal proceeding, in the United States it was remedial in nature. Now let me talk for a moment about procedurally how impeachment works in the United States. The House of Representatives initiates an impeachment by a simple majority vote. Keep that in mind because it's going to be important later on. The House then presents the articles of impeachment to the Senate for trial. You literally walk from one end of the Capitol down that large center aisle under the dome, come in the back entrance to the Senate, they've opened the doors, let you in, and you present the articles. Uh, in order to convict, there must be a vote of guilty by two-thirds of the senators then present and voting. It's not always 100. It, a lot of times it's somewhere between 90 and 100. Hamilton in the Federalist Papers number 65 stated the following. What, it may be asked, is the true spirit of the institution itself? Is it not designed as a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men? And here's something that I think if you don't take away anything else from this evening's talk, what I'm about to go into is the crux. Impeachment in the United States is neither a criminal prosecution nor a form of civil litigation. It is a unique remedial process designed to remove from office federal public officials who by their conduct have shown themselves unworthy of holding federal public office. The intent is not to punish the individual, but to protect the public. 
from injury at the hands of their own servants and to purify the public service. That last phrase is a quote from Hamilton. It's important to understand not every criminal offense necessarily requires impeachment. Moreover, the basis for impeachment does not have to be a criminal offense. The process is political as well as legal. The first effort at impeachment under the Constitution was a mistake. In 1797, the House impeached Senator William Blount for promoting war between the Cherokee Nation and Spain. We're not going to go into all that. He wasn't convicted, even he had been impeached, but he wasn't convicted because it was determined he is not, as a senator, a civil officer under the Constitution. So accordingly, he was expelled by the Senate, but it was not by the impeachment route. The same is true of the House. Members of the House are not subject to impeachment, but they can be expelled. The first true impeachment was in 1803 of a United States District Judge in New Hampshire named John Pickering. And I think I suggest that very first impeachment might be relevant today. The complaint against Pickering was that he would regularly appear on the bench intoxicated. And, and I'm quoting now from the charge, did then and there frequently in a most profane and indecent manner invoke the name of the supreme being, end quote. <laughs> President Jefferson asked Pickering to come to Washington and he refused. He would not cross a body of water. So he's staying up in New Hampshire. His son, he never appeared at his trial. His son appeared for him and quite reasonably pled insanity. He really was crazy. Um, now Pickering had not committed a crime. Nevertheless, he was convicted of high crimes and misdemeanors and removed from office. Was that removal proper or improper? Did he commit a high crime or misdemeanor? The term misdemeanor does not mean in the Constitution a minor criminal offense as the term is generally employed today. It's important. In the context of impeachment, the word focuses on the behavior of a public official, his demeanor. Governor Morris, who was one of the, um, he was at the, at the con when the Constitution was drafted, one of the founding fathers, and he was responsible for the final revisions to the Constitution, explained the use and meaning of the term misdemeanor. And he was referring specifically in this instance to judges. He said, the judges shall hold their office so long as they demean themselves well. But if they shall misdemean, if they shall on impeachment be convicted of misdemeanor, they shall be removed. Now, it's something of a tautology, sort of defining himself by defining himself internally. Um, I did a little research. Uh, the shorter Oxford English Dictionary defines the term misdemeanor as, quote, bad behavior, misconduct, misdeeds, paren, now rare, okay? So I'm suggesting that, why, that that's why the removal of Pickering, who didn't commit a crime, was consistent with the constitutional text, the misdemeanor part. It's fair to infer that egregiously unacceptable behavior, which does not rise to the level of criminality, can be a basis for impeachment and removal. There are three impeachments in American history that I want to go into in a little bit of detail. Two presidents and one Supreme Court justice who, as we'll see, was acting as a trial judge. In those days, you, they didn't just sit on the bench, you know, in that big marble building and uh, decide important cases. They actually went out and tried cases. The impeachment of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase in 1805 this is not long after Pickering, was very partisan and political. Chase was the most outspoken of the Federalists who dominated the judiciary. The Congress, which impeached him, was controlled by the Jeffersonian Republicans, who were the Anti-Federalists, and they claimed that Chase had displayed partisan bias on the bench. President Jefferson actually suggested to members of the House that they consider impeaching Chase. Now at this time, as I started to say, Supreme Court justices spent much of their time riding circuit, trying cases as trial judges and accompanied by the district court judge. 
All of the charges against Chase were based on alleged misconduct by way of his rulings while acting as a trial judge. Chase was a brilliant but irascible individual. He was known behind his back as Old Bacon Face <laughs> for his florid complexion and his bad temper. He was defended by a prominent lawyer, Luther Martin of Baltimore, who was known as Lawyer Brandy Bottle <laughs> because he had a serious problem with alcohol. But Chief Justice Rehnquist described Martin as one of the great lawyers in American history. Now, Chase's defense was one could disagree with his rulings. They may have been incorrect, but that does not constitute a high crime or misdemeanor. Oh, this is interesting. Presiding at the trial was Aaron Burr, who was still vice president at that time. Now, he had at the same time been charged with murder in New York and New Jersey for killing Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> One wag <clears throat> made the point that normally a judge presides at the trial of a murderer. Here, a murderer is presiding at the trial of a judge. <laughs> Irresistible. <laughs> Chase was acquitted on all charges, and that had a profound effect on the American judiciary. It assured the independence of federal judges from congressional oversight of their decisions, and that they would not be impeached based upon their judicial opinions. Several years later, Burr, who disappeared after this trial, like for two years nobody had gone off, uh, but Burr ultimately was arrested and tried for treason. He was acquitted. Who was his lawyer? Luther Martin. <laughs> Burr's father, by the way, was the second president of Princeton, then called the College of New Jersey, and Burr graduated from Princeton at the tender age of 16. Some years later, in 1810, Luther Martin appeared before Chase as counsel in a case in Baltimore. Again, there's a trial judge. He, that is, Martin, was visibly intoxicated. Chase stated to Martin, I'm surprised you can so prostitute your talents. To which Martin responded, I never prostituted my talents except when I defended you and Colonel Burr. <laughs> he then allegedly turned to the jury and said, a couple of the greatest rascals in the world. Chase, understandably, was incensed, and he began the process to hold Martin in contempt. He was about to sign the order, then put down the, his pen and said, this hand could never sign a citation against Luther Martin. One final fact about this. Martin suffered a stroke in 1819, but he lived on for another seven years, penniless and helpless. The Maryland legislature took notice of his condition and unanimously enacted what Chief Justice Rehnquist has described as a truly remarkable statute. Every lawyer admitted to practice in Maryland was required to pay annually to the clerk of the court in the county in which he practiced the sum of $5, which in those days was a considerable sum, the sum of $5 to be used for the benefit and support of Luther Martin. I like that. I want to turn now to the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated in April 1865. Vice President Andrew Johnson thereupon becomes President of the United States. Now Johnson's reputation is generally very negative, but his early life is very, it's quite remarkable. He was only three years old when his father dies and he was raised in abject poverty. At 14, he becomes a tailor's apprentice. It was then that the shop foreman taught him to read. In 1826, the family moved to eastern Tennessee, where Johnson married, at age 19, a woman who then taught him to write. This guy does not know how to read and write until he's 19 years old, at least. He opened a tailor shop, but he also entered public life and it has this meteoric rise. He rises from alderman to mayor of Greenville, Tennessee, to state representative, state senator, member of Congress, governor of Tennessee, U.S. senator from Tennessee, and vice president. Upon Lincoln's death, of course, he's sworn in as president. 
Now here's something important. Upon being sworn in, Johnson asks the members of Lincoln's cabinet to remain in office. That'll become important later. Over time, Johnson's policies toward the South alienated the so-called radical Republicans in the Congress. He vetoed various bills which he thought were too harsh on the South. Several of the cabinet members who had been part of Lincoln's cabinet resigned. But Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, did not resign, even though his sympathies were with the radical Republicans. Over the next several elections, the radical Republicans gained complete control of Congress. They passed several laws designed to tie Johnson's hands. One of these was the Tenure in Office Act. And what it said was that all federal officials whose appointment required Senate confirmation could not be removed without Senate approval. And Johnson decided he was going to remove Stanton as Secretary of War. He believed correctly that Stanton was committed to supporting the radical Republicans. So Johnson was impeached largely because of his violation of the Tenure in Office Act in replacing Stanton. Now, there were two very powerful arguments in Johnson's favor. The meaning of the act was highly debatable. Did it even apply to Stanton, to point out I made earlier, who was a holdover from Lincoln's presidency? Perhaps not. But second, and perhaps more important, doesn't the president, who was required under the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, have the unfettered right to remove subordinates in whom he no longer has confidence? The Republicans, the Democrats, of course, all supported Johnson. The Republicans could not lose more than six Republican votes in order to convict. As it turned out, seven Republicans voted not guilty. Johnson was acquitted by one vote. What's the significance of Johnson's acquittal? Again, according to Chief Justice Rehnquist, who was fascinated with impeachment. He, he wrote a book on it. When I was involved in a case, one of the judges I was involved in, it went up to the Supreme Court. Guess who wrote the opinion? Uh, Rehnquist, fascinated by impeachment. What's the significance of Johnson's acquittal? Well, according to Chief Justice Rehnquist, the Constitutional Convention of 1787 made an original contribution to our system of government. We have a presidential as opposed to a parliamentary system of government, wherein the executive is chosen by the electorate and is not dependent on the confidence of the legislature for his office. At least for a time, the result in the Johnson case reinforced the American political system's reluctance to resort to impeachment in a debatable case. But as we'll see, that reluctance was overridden with the impeachment of President William Jefferson Clinton. Now, prior to the Clinton impeachment, I had already served as special impeachment counsel for the two, two judges, Alcee Hastings and Walter Nixon. Before I turn to the Clinton impeachment, I want to note several points that came up in the case of Alcee Hastings. He was a federal judge in Florida. He was tried criminally, having been charged with conspiracy and obstruction of justice. Hastings had a co-defendant who was tried separately and who was convicted. Hastings, in his trial, was acquitted. Nevertheless, his judicial brethren in Florida were convinced that he had engaged in this criminal conduct. And they initiated a proceeding to get him impeached and removed. And he was impeached. His counsel at the impeachment trial raised questions. And the reason I talk about them here is because they would apply in any impeachment trial. First, what is the burden of proof at an impeachment, in an impeachment case? Is it the civil standard of preponderance of the evidence? Is it the criminal standard? beyond a reasonable doubt? Is it some intermediate standard, such as clear and convincing evidence, which is sometimes used? It was, all, it was argued and briefed. And the Senate in the Hastings impeachment did not resolve the issue. They said each senator should decide for himself or herself what standard they wanted to apply. And that's the way it stands today. That's the law on impeachment today on that issue. Another question raised in the Hastings case was, do the rules of evidence as applied in court proceedings, apply at an impeachment trial. The Senate decided generally yes, but they're not binding. 
And if the Senate wishes to consider hearsay, for example, it's allowed. Hastings had been acquitted in his criminal trial, and he was nevertheless impeached. So it raised the question, did his impeachment trial constitute double jeopardy? Question was argued before the Senate. The vote was 92 to 1. It was not double jeopardy. And as we've said earlier, it's not a criminal proceeding. The only holdout, if you're interested, was Howard Metzenbaum of Ohio. <laughs> Um, I was hired by NBC as an on-air analyst for the Clinton impeachment, and I've got to say it was a fascinating experience, and I sort of had a ringside seat for the proceedings. Uh, very, it was a great experience. Let's talk about Clinton. He was elected in 1992, and in the fall of 93, the Republicans were already calling for the appointment of an independent counsel to investigate a business deal, which the Clintons had invested in and lost a lot of money, by the way, Whitewater Land Company. This will probably bring back some memories for some of you. Also, there was the death of Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster, who had committed suicide. His death, however, was somehow linked to the Clintons in the eyes of some conspiracy theorists. So an independent counsel, a Republican, very distinguished former United States Attorney, Robert Fisk, was appointed. And after a five-month investigation, he concluded no prosecutions were justified. But just as Fisk was finishing up, the independent counsel law was renewed. And a panel of three judges replaced Fisk with Kenneth Starr, a constitutional lawyer who had no prosecutorial experience and was a very partisan Republican veteran of the Reagan and Bush administrations. Now, for a long time, the Starr investigation was going nowhere. And finally, Starr announces, I'm resigning. I'm going to become dean of Pepperdine Law School. This led to an outcry among conservative Republicans, in particular William Sapphire. Starr was denounced as, quote, craven, unquote. So he abandoned his plans. He said he just wasn't going to fight about it, and he continues to investigate. Eventually, Clinton's sexual misconduct with an intern, Monica Lewinsky, was unearthed. At one point, Clinton testified, I did not have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky, apparently using a very narrow definition of sex. <laughs> Later, Clinton was asked about his attorney's claim, there is no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form. That's what his attorney said, and now Clinton's being asked about it. So Clinton replies, well, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. We all remember that. Uh, if it means is and never has been, that's one thing. If it means there is none, that was a completely true statement, end quote. Too clever by half. Uh, this verbal fencing did not make the problem go away. Starr produced a lengthy graphic report of Clinton's behavior, which the House then made public, and Clinton was impeached by the House on two grounds, obstruction of justice and perjury before a grand jury. A poll showed 65% of Americans felt that Clinton was being attacked for purely personal misconduct. Some Republicans, including former President Gerald Ford, pushed for censure rather than impeachment. Republicans said this case was not about sex. It was about lying under oath. Dale Bumpers, <clears throat> a former senator from Arkansas, testified, and I quote, when you hear someone say this is not about sex, you can be sure it's about sex. <laughs> now, you need a two-thirds majority to convict, so with all 100 senators present and voting, conviction would require 67 votes of guilty, and the vote in the Senate was not really close, 55-45 on one article, 50-50 on another. But despite Clinton's not being convicted, his presidency was severely wounded. His conduct diminished him and the office of the presidency. Indeed, the impeachment process itself was trivialized. One historian <clears throat> called the Clinton impeachment a train wreck, and that's a pretty accurate description. OK, the Clinton impeachment took place in 1999 it was not until 2010 that another impeachment was tried in the Senate. Okay. 
This was the case of G. Thomas Porteous, a U.S. District Judge in Louisiana, whose trial and conviction was unique in the history of impeachment. And it, this is sort of the transition to more current issues uh, regarding impeachment. His trial and conviction may have serious implications for the nature and scope of what constitutes impeachable conduct. While Porteous was a state court judge, he set up a scheme with some local lawyers whereby he would assign something called curatorships to the, the cases to them. And all the local lawyers had to do was fill out a couple of forms and file it with court. I'm sure it was done by a paralegal. And then they would pay, be paid $300. Well, Porteous would drop by periodically and pick up an envelope with cash in it representing his cut. Over time, Porteous received approximately $20,000 in this fashion. Porteous also had a deal with a local bail bondsman. The bondsman would tell Porteous the level at which to set the bail so that it was the highest number that the uh, inmate could make. It, if it's too high, it doesn't benefit anybody. So you want to get it as high, the bondsman wants to get it as high as possible. Um, in return, and Porteous would comply. In return, from time to time, the bondsman would bring Porteous ice chests full of Gulf shrimp. He'd include a few bottles of whiskey. He would arrange to have Porteous's car repaired. Now, Porteous was constantly under pressure for money. He had a weakness for gambling and alcohol, lethal combination. Now, Porteous was nominated much, I mean, now that we look back, he was nominated to be a federal judge. And the FBI background investigation failed to uncover Porteous's corrupt relationships. So he becomes a federal judge. Now, this meant more money and a lifetime appointment, but it didn't solve his financial problems. Eventually, he goes bankrupt. He lies on his bankruptcy application, and now he's being investigated by the FBI. It didn't lead to criminal prosecution, but a report was eventually sent to the House Judiciary Committee, and it is the House Judiciary Committee, by the way, that handles impeachments. Um, Peter Rodino, if you remember back in the Nixon, that way he was the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, um, sent to the House Judiciary. Now, ch the chairman appointed certain members to be managers to pursue the matter. Uh, the two that stand there were about five or six. One was Adam Schiff, who you may see from time to time. He's now on the uh, Senate, I'm, I'm sorry, the House uh, Intelligence Committee. And the other was Bob Goodlatte. And Bob Goodlatte is now the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. So these, at this time, the Democrats controlled. Um, I think John Conyers at that time headed the committee, who's now left the scene. Um, I was brought in from the private sector as special impeachment counsel. I had two of these under my belt, so here we are. Uh, I put together a team of lawyers, and we investigated the charges. We set up hearings, gathered witnesses, including three distinguished constitutional law scholars. They testified, and this is important, at the hearing, there is no basis in the Constitution, nor is there a basis in policy for the House or Senate not to consider pre-federal bench conduct as a grounds for impeachment. In other words, Porteous could be impeached for what he did before he became a federal judge. Okay, now you're starting to see some implications to that. <laughs> Four articles of impeachment were voted against Porteous. Three articles were based on conduct as a federal judge, and we don't have to go there. The fourth article was unique. For the first time in American history, a federal official, in this case a judge, was impeached for conduct he engaged in before he became a federal official. The vote on the, and this was argued, but the vote on the fourth article to convict in the Senate was 90 to 6 for conviction, not even close. It was a stunning result and a seismic shift, in my view, in constitutional law relating to impeachment. So this brings us to a profound question of constitutional law. Can a president be impeached and removed from office for conduct engaged in prior to becoming president. 
On September 28, 2017, the New York Review of Books, which I assume some of you subscribe to, published an article by Professor Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School and Jacob Weisberg, the editor of Slate, and it was titled, What Are Impeachable Offenses? It caught my attention. They rejected the idea that pre-presidential conduct could be a basis for impeachment and further took the position that the president is immune from criminal prosecution until he leaves office. Two distinct, very important points. As I read the article, they did not give any compelling reason why such should be the case. They just said it. I responded to them in writing. I only addressed one of the issues. I contested their views on the effect of pre-presidential conduct, and I cited the Porteous case. I think they're wrong on both issues, and we'll get into that. On December 11, 2017, just a few weeks later, The New Yorker magazine published an article by Jeffrey Tubin, very bright guy, I like him a lot, called The Russian Portfolio. Tubin interviewed Professor Cass Sunstein of Harvard Law School. Tubin stated, now this is his, these are his words, it seems clear that the president can be impeached for conduct that took place before he took office, especially if the misdeeds led to his electoral victory. Tubin then quoted Sunstein as saying, if you procure your office by corrupt means, that would be an impeachable offense. So the issues are joined. Two Harvard Law School professors plus me. Uh, <laughs> now, I think Tubin and Sunstein are being overly cautious by focusing on possible collusion with the Russians regarding the election itself. But I guess they didn't want to go any further than they had to. But why stop there? Suppose it could be shown, as had been suggested by Robert Mueller's recent appointment of money laundering experts to his team, suppose it could be shown that Mr. Trump, prior to becoming president, was involved in laundering large amounts of money cooperating with the Russians. Could he remain president of the United States immune from impeachment and removal? I'm not going to answer it. I'll leave it to you to answer it. Think about it. But that's the real question. Let's go to another question that deals with current issues. Can a president be prosecuted criminally while he's still in office? About six months ago, a memo on that very subject was discovered that had been prepared by a conservative professor of constitutional law, Ronald Rotunda, at the request of Ken Starr regarding President Clinton. Now, the memo was never used, never surfaced. They just went the impeachment route. But here's what the memo said, and I'm quoting. It is proper, constitutional, and legal for a federal grand jury to indict a sitting president for serious criminal acts that are not part of and are contrary to the president's official duties. In this country, no one, not even the president, is above the law, end quote. I believe that conclusion is absolutely correct in principle. But there are enormous practical considerations in prosecuting a sitting president criminally. He has all of the rights of a criminal defendant, uh, right to jury trial, automatic right to an appeal. The prim criminal process could go on for years. Meanwhile, he is still president. He is not incapacitated per the 25th Amendment which has to do with the president, you know, has a stroke or something. That doesn't apply. He's just otherwise engaged, defending himself in a criminal case. I think it is, even though, as a matter of constitutional law, I believe a criminal case can be brought against a sitting president, the practical implications are extremely difficult. Far better to impeach and remove the president, and then, if circumstances warrant, proceed with a criminal trial, because the defendant at that point is no longer president. And one would think that much of the evidence that would be used in a criminal case could just be used in an impeachment trial. Anyway, what if the House, here's a nice question. <clears throat> what if the House is taken over by the Democrats in November, but the Senate remains in Republican hands? Now remember, the House only needs a simple majority, one vote, to impeach. 
and let's assume they impeach the president. The House manager, managers solemnly march the articles of impeachment down that long hall, under the dome, knock on the door, in, admitted to the Senate chamber, and they present the articles of impeachment. The Senate says, thanks, we'll get back to you. House never hears anything further from the Senate. Can the Senate be forced to proceed with a trial? I think not. The Constitution gives the Senate the sole power to try the impeachment. None of that language is mandatory. It does not say the Senate shall then proceed to trial. It's not, it doesn't say it. It just gives them the power to do it. So my, I think if when we're construing that, they don't have a constitutional obligation to go to trial. Here's another interesting question. Can the president pardon himself? Now, first understand a pardon only relates to the criminal pro a criminal prosecution. The Constitution specifically, specifically says uh, that the pardon power does not apply to impeachments. Okay, so it only applies to criminal case. Clearly, the president can pardon everyone else, family members, advisors, and the like. But again, can he pardon himself? Now, it's noteworthy, Richard Nixon did not pardon himself. He was pardoned by his successor, Gerald Ford. There is a fundamental legal principle. No one may be a judge in his own case. That principle was invoked in a Justice Department memo dated 1974 concerning Richard Nixon. So I think that, that was accepted as the, the law. Larry Tribe, a Harvard Law School constitutional law professor and my law school classmate, specifically concurs with that Justice Department memo as applied to President Trump. So I think there is a clear consensus the president cannot pardon himself. Impeachment at its core is not punitive. It's intended to protect the public and the institutions of government from those who've shown themselves unworthy of holding public office. In the final analysis, as Alexander Hamilton put it, it is a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. Thank you.